Right, uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. May I have your attention, please? Right, before I start, are there any questions? Any questions? No questions. I started a chapter five last week and uh, covered uh, slides one to eight. Before I continue uh, with uh, chapter five, I just uh, want uh, to give the answers to some of the questions I received last week. And that was in regard to question 13, I believe, and question 15 of a chapter, yes, 13 and 15 of chapter 4. I uploaded it for you online, but however, if you haven't noticed it, in question 13, the shear modulus is 80 gigapascals. I believe one of the students sitting there asked instead of 85 gigapascals. And the missing data in question 15 was the, the value of the torque, uh, which was 100 newton meters, shear modulus 30 for aluminum gigapascals, and the vertical wall was 2A, not 2A. So these two were missing, and the vertical wall on the figure was 2A instead of A. And I also uh, noticed that when I was explaining this equation, I kept saying BT cubed. This is the correct value for the maximum uh, shear stress for a thin strip subject to a torque. So I don't know why, but when I was explaining it twice, I said BT cubed, which should have been BT squared. So this happens at the top and bottom layers of the thin strip or an open section with uniform thickness. So we move on uh, to chapter five. Um, first, I would like to uh, just highlight, uh, highlight the materials we had last week, and then we continue from a slide number nine. So when we have a beam of a uniform cross-sectional area along its length, which is clapped at what end, and is subject to a torque subject to a moment where the plane of the moment is a normal to the cross-section. When we say the beam is subject to bending. A beam can bend by moment, pure moment. It could bend by a lateral shear force or a lateral concentrated force. It can also bend by distributed load. The distributed load could be partially acting on the beam, it could be uniform, it could be linear, non-linear. These were the symbols we use uh, in this chapter, and which I explained it uh, to you last week. And as I said, the shear force and bending moment distributions for a beam subject to a series of loads are not usually uniform. They are so we write them in terms of the Z coordinates. XY for the beam bending analysis, majority of textbooks, they attach XY coordinate system on the cross section and Z is along the axis of the beam. But the origin of this Z is at the left end of the beam. In some books they put it at the right, but it doesn't make any difference. So the other thing I should emphasize is that we analyze beams which are symmetric. When we say symmetric, the beam has at least one axis of the cross-section of the beam has at least one axis of symmetry. It could have two, but it could have, it must have at least one axis of symmetry to be considered as a symmetry bending. So when we were analyzing structures in chapter one, chapter two, and chapter four, the previous chapter, the external load was uniform. So when we're analyzing some bar subject to axial loading, the force was uniform along the length. In chapter two, the pressure was also uniformly distributed inside the pressure vessel. And then we moved on to chapter four. Again, the torque was uniform along the length. That is, 
what the concept of theories of bending is. Theories of bending is based on that. What makes a bending analysis a, a bit harder than the other chapters we've covered is that, as you can see, a beam can, can be subject to a series of forces applied to it. It could be subject to a concentrated force, nonlinear distributed load, pure bending moment. So therefore, along the length, as I said earlier, the shear force is varying with respect to Z. The bending moment is varying along the length. Therefore, at each section, we don't have the same normal stress or shear stress acting. So the, for, the external force is not uniformly distributed like the previous chapters. So shear force is changing along the length. This bending moment is changing along the length. And I showed you how we, I mean, you already knew how to draw the shear force and bending moment diagrams. Or you can write general equations to find the shear force, the bending moment at each section. The other thing is uh, the sign of the bending moment. You say a bending moment is a positive when after the deformation, the bottom layer of the beam is convex and the top layer is concave. We call a bending moment negative when the top layer of the beam is convex, the shape is convex, or, and the bottom one is concave. So I showed you, you already knew, to write the general equations for a beam subject to bending. As I said, because it's subject to it, different sets of loads applied to a beam. So in order to find the stresses, deflection, or um, any other information about the beam, the first thing we need to do, we need to write the general equation for the dis equations for the distributed load, shear force, and bending moment. So as you can see, they're all different, and shear force and bending moment is changing along the length, which I showed you using equilibrium, the relations between the shear force, bending moment, and distributor load. Now we move on to a slide number nine. So we've done the shear force and bending moment distributions. We know what the value of shear force and bending moment is at each section. Now the next stage is finding a normal stresses acting at each section and shear stresses acting at each section. So this is a typical beam. I added this figure, I borrowed it from another slide, I think it's slide number four, or added it to a slide number nine because I can't show two slides to you at the same time. So this is a beam. The Z coordinate is along the length and its origin is attached at the left end. So I'm looking at a small element of this beam. So the length of this small element is dz. At the moment, I assume the beam is subject to just pure bending moment. So there is no lateral shear force. I just showed you this figure, so I want you to visualize what dz is. But at the moment, I'm applying just pure bending moment of the element on, on this beam. Am I looking at a small element of it? Now, based on this deformation you see on this slide, you can see the top layer has become a slightly shorter, and the bottom layer of the, this uh, small element has become a slightly longer. It means there must be a layer in between which has no deformation. So the top layer has become a slightly shorter, which is and the bottom layer has become slightly longer. So based on the information you already know from chapter one, if something gets shorter, it means it's subject to compression, and if something is, gets longer, it means it's subject to tension. So there must be a layer in between which has no deformation. That layer is located on the neutral plane. We call it a plane which, has, which is subject to no stress or no strain. It's undeformed. And where the neutral plane intersects the cross-section, we call it a neutral axis. So this is a neutral plane, the plane of a no stress and a strain. And where it intersects the cross-section, we call it neutral axis. Now, based on this, 
they figure I've shown you, the top layer is, gets compressed, so it must be subject to compression or compressive stress, and the bottom layer must be subject to tension. So based on what I'm showing you, the, the beam which is subject to positive bending, all layers at the moment above the neutral axis must be subject to compression. So we call it, in, term, in bending, we call it compression sign. And all the year layers below the neutral plane, as you can see here, this is the maximum, all these layers are subject to tension. So we call it tensile side. So if the top layer is subject to compression and the bottom layer is subject to tension, in theories of bending, there is no force applied in the x direction, in the z direction, <coughs> sorry. So it means the resultant of forces on the top, in the top layer and the bottom layer must be equal to zero. We can conclude that, that the neutral axis, <coughs> sorry. we can conclude that the neutral axis must pass through the center of gravity of the section. So we have the top layer, which is subject to compression, the bottom layer, which is subject to tension, the resultant forces of the two must be equal because we have no forces applied in the z direction of the beam based on the theories of bending. So therefore, based on that, the neutral axis must pass through the center of gravity of this section. Now this is something I'm just sure based on just physical appearance of the loads applied on the diagram I'm showing you. But mathematically, you can find the proof in the aircraft structures by Mixon. Or all the e-books which are at the moment are available. If you refer to theories of bed section, they mathematically show you why a neutral axis passes through the center of gravity of this section. So if we look at a fiber which is located at the distance of y from the neutral axis, as you can see, this fiber is located in the compression side. Therefore, if I look at this beam, the cross-section of the beam, that fiber looks the way I have drawn it for you here. So if I look at this fiber in this direction, this is that element or that fiber which is located at distance of y from the neutral axis. So based on the top layer getting shorter and the bottom layer getting longer. So this part at the moment is on the compression side and is subject to com compressive stress or normal stress. So I've used the symbol sigma to show it. And I've also added z here. I want you to understand this force, this stress here is along the z axis. It's not along the x axis or along the y axis. So it's normal to the cross section. Now we assume the section has at least one axis of symmetry. So the one on the right hand side also has one axis of symmetry. So the theories I'm going to cover for you is not necessarily for rectangular section, any section which has at least one axis of symmetry. So on this slide, I'll show you the concept of normal stress when a beam is subject to bending. If there are no questions, I'll move on to the next slide. The other thing, I think I need to explain this one as well. So when we analyze beams, at the moment what you see is an exaggerated deformed geometry of a beam subject to bending. You're talking about a small deflection, like the beams at the moment are holding us in place. So if we if a small deflection, we can say this element, this beam, is like an arc. It's located on an arc. So when it is deformed, we can say this is like an arc, and the, this is the center of the arc. So for the beams at the moment holding us in position, the center of this arc is quite high up near the sky. So this is the neutral plane. And this is called a radius of the curvature. So we assume this neutral plane. This is an arc. The, this 
The radius of this arc is called radius of the curvature, so we show it with R, and one over R is called curvature. So the bending analysis we are doing is for a small curvature. I repeat, that is the radius of the curvature. One over R is curvature. So in book states, you usually say, a small curvatures. We have another set of theories for large curvatures when R is not as large as it is here. Yes, please. Which diagram? This one, the real one, you said. <laughs> okay, it, what I said at the moment, in order for you to understand and make my life a slightly easier to explain it, I have drawn the beam as a rectangular section. A rectangular section has two axes of symmetry. But the theories which I'm going to cover is for symmetric bending. The section has at least one axis of symmetry. So I have drawn a shape for you. It's on the right-hand side. So it's not something you usually see. So that's why I've shown you so it's a bit peculiar. But it has one axis of symmetry. It doesn't answer the question. OK. So radius of the curvature and curvature, which is 1 over r. So move on to a slide number 10. So the, this example I showed you, the beam was subject to pure bending. Well, as I said earlier, a beam can bend if it's subject to a lateral shear force or a lateral distributed load. But what's the difference between these two cases? If I apply a lateral shear force here, based on what we already know from chapter one, if I apply a force, a shear force, there must be shear stresses or shear forces acting at the cross-section for the component to stay in equilibrium. The shear stress is always complementary. Whenever we have shear stress on a plane, we also ha always have shear stresses on a plane normal to the first one. So if I've we have shear stresses acting on the cross-section, there must be shear stresses acting because of the characteristic of shear stress being complementary to that. It must be on planes which are normal to the plane of the cross-section. So we call them longitudinal shearing stresses. But why do we have these shear stresses? Say we've got a stack of papers on top of each other, or a stack of very thin flat plates on top of each other. If I apply a shear force similar to what you see here, you see this stepped formation on the sides. If you can take a book and you apply the force, you can see we have a step, so a step of formation on the two sides. It means if I apply a shear force and there is no restraints at two ends, therefore there won't be any shear stresses between the layers. They can be free to move against each other. Now if you look at a beam made of aluminium, titanium, this is how you see the two ends of the beam. You can see we don't have a step formation similar to what you see here. So because the two ends are restraints are fixed, so if I apply a shear force at the top, then for these layers, there will be shear stresses among these layers. So that's why when I apply a shear force on a beam, not only the, the beam experiences shear stress on the cross-section, also in the longitudinal direction, based on what you see on the top. So what do we conclude from the slides 9 and 10? If I have a beam, if subject to pure bending moment, then the cross-section is just subject to normal stresses. If I have a beam subject to lateral shear force or distributed load, not only we have a normal stresses acting on the cross-section, also we have a shear stress, shear stresses on the cross-section and in the longitudinal direction of the beam. So we, which I am going to explain it later on, um, maybe today or next week, that these are called flexural shear stresses. In chapter one, we call them pure shear or simple shear. 
But if you have got shear stresses, because lateral shear force or distributed load, we call it a flexural shear stresses, which come in the future slides. Yes. So, the, so parallel to the cross section equals flexural, right? Both of them are called flexural shear stresses. If, I've got a if, if I apply a lateral shear force to a beam which is subject to bending, it applies shear stresses on the cross section and along the length of the beam. This shear stress is not called pure shear or simple shear, it's called flexural shear stress. It is defined in future slides, so I went ahead of the myself. So I just, so this is shear stress and this is a normal stress. So I just explained what they are physically, now I'm going to theoretically show you how we can find those two when a beam is subject to bending. So this is just a summary of what I've covered at the moment. So we've got a beam subject to bending. This is the neutral plane, the plane of no stress or no strain. This is, at the moment, a subject to pure bending moment, which we can simulate it using a couple in the lab. If I apply pure bending moment, the cross-section is subject to normal stresses. And I'll show you later on, it has a linear variation in terms of y, distance from the neutral axis. If a beam is subject to lateral shear force, then not only we have a shear stress on the cross-section, but also in the longitudinal direction of the beam. And why? Because shear stress is always a complementary. On top of that, we're also interested in the deflection of, the, of a beam. In this case, we want to know how much it deflects in the y direction or the vertical displacement of any point along the beam. This is the basic or base for design and analysis of beams. Deflection and normal, normal stress and shear stresses. So this, ignore that at the moment. So we move on to normal stress. So how to theoretically find the normal stress applied on the cross section when a beam is subject to bending. So we are looking at a fiber with the distance from, at the moment this is subject to positive bending and we are looking at a fiber which is located at a distance of y from the neutral axis. Is this fiber in the compression side at the moment or is it on the, in the tensile side? Yes, please? Well done. It's on the compression side. It means it's getting a slightly shorter. Now, R is the radius of the curvature. It's always measured from the neutral plane of the beam, not from the top layer or the bottom layer. So if you're looking at a small element of this beam, now in this case, I can say the central angle of this little element is d theta, which actually I'll show you later on, is the difference between the slopes of these two points. Now, before, similar to what we did in the previous slide, in the previous chapters, we make some assumptions for, in theories of bending, analysis of a beam subject to bending. The first assumption is that the Young's modulus is the same in compression and tension. Majority of materials, they have different Young's modulus, different Young's moduli and different Parson ratios when they are subject to compression and tension. In theories of bending, we assume they are the same. So we assume in compression and tension, we have the same Young's modulus, the same Parson ratio. Every, every material property is the same. Similar to what we did with the torsion section, the cross sections remain plain. So there is no warping displacement like open thin wall sections when they are subject to torsion. We assume uh, throughout this chapter, the cross sections remain a plane and they remain a normal to the axis of the beam, Z axis. And this is the theory that bending is based on. The cross section is uniform, it's not tapered. And the deflections are small. This is also called a small curve curvature theory or a small deflection theory. 
So the reflections are small and the curvature of the beam is small, which I've shown you. The curvature is 1 over r. So these are the assumptions based on, if you're analyzing, analyzing a beam, based on the theories of bending. So now we're looking at the fiber, that red fiber, which is located at a distance of y in the compression side from the neutral axis. So we, that fiber is getting shorter. So I can say, based on what you, we know from chapter one, the strain in that fiber is equal to the change in, in its length divided by its original length. So we said the, this layer has no change in length. So I can say the original length of this fiber is this A naught, B naught, which is located on the neutral plane. And delta is the change in length between these two. So if I somehow found, find the length of this A naught, B naught, and I find the length of A prime, B prime, the difference between two, these two is L, delta. And that is the original length. The central angle of this arc is del d theta. So therefore, I can say the original length, which is a naught b naught, is equal to r multiplied by the central angle of d theta. Delta is equal to the difference between these two. So I can say is equal to r d theta minus r minus y times d theta. So this is r d theta, which is this length which is the original length, and the difference between two, these two is r minus y times d theta. Now, r d theta can be cancelled out, so we end up with minus y over r. So a strain at any fiber from the neutral axis is equal to the distance of that fiber from the neutral axis divided by the radius of the curvature. If it's on the compression side, you see a sign, a negative sign here. If it's on the tensile side, you see a positive sign over there. Now, this fiber is like a bar which is subject to compression. So from the stress strain curve, I can say the stress in this fiber, because this fiber we established is subject to normal stress. So I can say the stress in that fiber from the stress strain curve is equal to epsilon multiplied by the Young's modulus. Where does this come from? From the stress strength curve of a unidirectional loading. Now I'm going to substitute the value of the epsilon in this equation. Therefore, F, the stress is equal to minus y times Young's modulus divided by r. What does this equation tell us? E is a constant value, it's a material property. For a particular value of m, r is a constant value. So therefore, stress is a linear function in terms of y. When y is equal to zero, which is on the neutral axis, the stress is zero. And when y is maximum, when on the top and bottom layers, we have the maximum normal stresses applied to the beam. So it means the stress distribution has a linear variation in terms of y. Now this equation is handy, but the problem is we cannot keep measuring r for each value of m we are applying. So we are going to get to the r in our equation, the radius of the curvature. Now look at this element at the moment. It's subject to a normal stress of sigma z. I have added this subscript z because it's normal and it's in the direction of z axis. Now look at this strip. It's subject to a normal stress of sigma z, and say this area is dA. So if I multiply these two, this gives me the force applied to this element. This force is located at a distance of y from the neutral axis. So if I multiply by y, it gives me a tiny force, a tiny moment. So sigma z times dA is a force. If I multiply it by y, it gives it the moment this force is applying with respect to the neutral axis. So if I divide or discretize the cross-section to a series of elements and add up all these moments together, or 
mathematically, if I integrate this term from the top layer to the bottom layer of the cross-section, this becomes the resisting moment from the material. And this must be equal to the external moment applied. So now I've got a relation between the moment, external moment, and the stress applied on the cross-section. Now I'm going to substitute this equation here. This is showing me the stress in the z direction. I'm going to substitute it in this relation. E is constant, R is constant. They can be extracted from the integral. And the remaining part will be integral of y squared dA from the top layer to the bottom layer. From chapter 3, what did we call y squared dA? Does anyone remember? Yes, please? Uh, well done. Second moment of area, very good. So this is the second moment of area of the cross-section with respect to the neutral axis. So I can say this is equal to I, which is with respect to x-axis, Ix. So I haven't written Ix here, but at the moment we're analyzing the beam and we are finding that integral with respect to the y axis. So therefore this is the second moment of area with respect to the sorry x axis. So therefore m is equal to minus e i over r. On the other hand, sigma is equal to minus y e over r. Now if I just combine this equation, I can get you the bar because we can use r, but we cannot keep measuring r. So we need to get rid of it. So if I combine these equations, I can get rid of R, I can eliminate it. I can say sigma is equal to my over I, which I, please write down, is I with respect to X axis. So you can see stress, the normal stress applied on the cross section is a linear function in terms of Y. We have Zero stress when y is zero, which is neutral axis or neutral plane. And we have maximum stresses acting on the top and bottom layers when y is equal to y2 or y equal to y1. Any question in relation to slide 12? Okay. Now let's... And this is also valid for this cross section. I know it's peculiar. The shape is not very, is, we haven't got a beam looking like that, but it has one axis of symmetry. Now, yes, excellent. It has one axis of symmetry, yes. Now, I have already given you the complete solution for all the sections of question number one. It's already available online. What I'm going to do, I'm going to solve different parts of just one case for you, and the rest of them already available online. However, during the tutorial on from the solving session on Friday, if you have any questions in regard to those solutions, yes, please ask me. But uh, during the lecture, I'm going to solve one of the cases, I believe this is which is similar to the one you did experimental in the lab. I saw all three parts of it during the lecture. So in question number one, you see a beam of the length is given with the cross-sectional area of 60 millimeters by 120 millimeters, and it's subject to a different sets of loads, distributed load, concentrated forces. The beam is either cantilever or simply supported. The first part of the question, the problem is asking us to find the maximum normal stress applied to the beam and its location. So I'm going to start with this, the easiest one, the cantilever beam. If you remember last week, I showed you how to write the general equations for this beam. So these are what I've already done for you. Distributed load, shear force, and bending moment, which are function of Z. 
The length of the beam is 2 meters. The force applied at 10 kilonewtons at the free end and is made of aluminium. The problem is asking us to find the maximum normal stress applied to the beam and its location and also the stress at the in a fiber which is located at a distance of 30 millimeters from the neutral axis. So this is a cross section of the beam. This is the neutral axis, the axis of no stress or strain. And that's the equation which we're going to use. The problem is asking us to find the maximum stress, maximum normal stress. I is constant. The second moment of area of the cross section is 1 over 12 B H cubed. Now, in order for the stress to be maximum, is that M to be maximum and Y to be maximum. Now, look at the bending moment diagram. Where is the position of the maximum bending moment applied? The maximum bending moment is at the very root. Yes, it, that's, that's correct, very good. So, if you have a cantilever beam, always the maximum bending moment occurs at the clamp support. So, as you can see, we can find the maximum bending moment, which is equal to FL. You can also find it from the general equation. So, the maximum bending moment is sorted. I is constant. Now, there is the position of the maximum normal stress on the cross section. Is it at the, on the neutral axis, top layer, or bottom layer? Where is the position of the maximum normal stress? It has a linear variation. We get the maximum values at the top and bottom layers, and we get the zero value on the neutral plane or neutral axis. So, in that case, what is the value of y equal to for the maximum value? Any answer? What is the distance? Which point has the maximum distance from the neutral axis? This is zero. So y is equal to 60. Very good. So y equal to plus minus 60 will give us the maximum normal stresses applied to the section. One is compression, the other one is tension. So I just, I'm after the maximum normal stress, I is constant, these two must be maximum, M max occurs at the clamp support, and so at the clamp support, at the top and bottom layers, we get the maximum normal stresses, compression and tension. So this is equal to the maximum bending moment, which is FL, 20 kilonewton meters, Y max is plus minus 60, I is equal to 1 over 12 BHQ, B is 60 millimeters, height is 120. And from there, we find 139 megapascals, plus minus. Now, at this point here, is this a positive bending moment or is it a negative bending moment? So this is the deformation of the beam. At this location, is it a positive bending moment or is it a negative bending moment? Negative or positive? Negative. negative. So the top layer is convex. So if I draw the whole beam for you here, similar to what you did experiment on, if this is the beam, so the top layer is subject to compression, sorry, tension, and the bottom layer is subject to compression. When you apply the bending, the top layer gets longer, and the bottom layer gets slightly shorter. It's very similar to the beam you did experiment on. Any question in relation to this one? Now, the next stage is to find the normal stress acting at fibers which are located at a distance of 30 millimeters from the neutral axis or neutral plane. 
but he's ask, asking us to find the maximum value for those fibers. Obviously, the maximum values again happen at this end. So I'm just writing the equation. So you can see M is the same, second moment of area is the same. The only difference is the coordinate of Y, which will be looking at this fiber, which is located at a distance of 30 millimeters from the neutral axis. So it has a linear variation. We have the maximum values at the top and bottom, and then we have zero value on the neutral axis, on the neutral plane. Any question in relation to this slide? Now let's solve question number two, which is very, very similar to the tube you, are, you did experiment on and you're completing your laboratory assessment sheets. So we've got the same cantilever beam, which is subject to a lateral shear force of 10 kilonewtons at its tip. The length is two meters. The cross section is circular. It's a hollow tube with the outer diameter of 150, inner diameter 130, and the thickness of 10. The problem is asking us to find the maximum normal stresses acting on the beam, and obviously the max, in, this is the cantilever beam, the maximum stress happens at the clamp support, and it's asking us to find the stresses at points A, B, and C near the built-in support. So what is the value of bending moment equal to? You're not drawing the shear force of bending moment diagrams. It's quite straightforward. If you look at this beam, what is the value of the bending moment applied at the support? 20 kilonewtons. That's correct. So we've got 10 kilonewton multiplied by 2. It gives us 20 kilonewton meters. And this is a negative bending moment, so the top part is subject to tension and the bottom part is subject to compression. So M is equal to 20 kilonewton meters. Now the problem is asking us to find stresses at points A and B and C near the clamp support. What is the coordinate of A equal to? In the XY coordinate system, which is attached to the cross section, what is the coordinate of A equal to? Oh, come on, yes, please. Um, is That's correct, absolutely. So the top layer is located at the distance of 75 millimeters from the neutral axis. This is a neutral axis for this beam. It has two axes of symmetry. This is the neutral axis. The bending moment is about the x-axis. The coordinate of point A is the half the outer diameter, which is 75. So Y max is 75. And what is the coordinate of B is minus 75. M max, we found it, 10 kilonewton time, kilonewtons times two meters. So I just substitute the values. So what is the coordinate of point C? Coordinate of point C? Is it 10, 20, 0? What is the coordinate of C in the XY coordinate system? It's located on the x-axis. What is the y-coordinate of C? Zero. That's correct. So therefore, the normal stress acting on point, at point C must be equal to zero. So point C is located on the neutral plane. It has a coordinate of zero because the distance of the y coordinate of C, C is equal to zero. So based on this equation, 
When I apply a bending moment, CE remains on its rest. Are there any questions with regard to this slide? Yes, please. Yes, of course you can. So say you, that's a very good question because it has a linear variation. So if I draw it for you, so if you've got, at the moment, you're pulling it. So this is subject to, if I just draw it for you. So the top layer, where did the color come from? Okay. So the top layer is subject to tension the bottom layer is subject to compression. It has a linear variation. So we have tension, tension, compression, compression. And if you're interested in a point here, this is what the question you asked. So you have a coordinate, whatever coordinate you have, you can easily find it. So you can see it's located on the tension, tensile side. If you just substitute the coordinate of this point, in this equation, not this equation, you can easily find this stress. Does that answer the question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. Does it matter if you write plus minus or minus plus? Of course it matters. When we say the beam is subject to positive or bending, negative bending moment, it identifies whether the top section is subject to tension or is subject to compression. When we use for, so this is a sign convention for bending moments, which is plus or minus. The sign convention for stress is what you learned in chapter one. Positive is for tension and negative is for compression. So when we say plus minus, the negative is I ask you a question now. If I say it is minus 138.5 megapascals, am I referring to the bottom layer or top layer? Bottom, bottom layer, well done. So if I say minus 138.5, then I'm referring to the bottom part of it. Yes. Any other questions? So would you like me um, to carry on with the slide 14 or would you like to take a break 10 minutes and then come back here three minutes to, yes, would you like, okay. So see you in uh, three minutes to 11, please.
Three minutes to eleven. Uh, so when a beam is subject to bending, in order to design it, in order to, to analyze it, we need to find uh, the normal stress applied to the section to each section of the beam. We need to find out the shear stress applied to each se section of the beam. Also, we are interested to know how much deflection the beam has. So in this case, is the displacement in the y direction. The beam is subject to a bending moment about the x-axis. So I move on to deflection first because the shear stress is slightly harder. This is something you already know, so I can quickly go through it with you. These are the two equations I showed you. We can find a using equilibrium of a small element of the beam. I showed you last week that the slope of the bending distribution, if you have an equation, if you have a curve, I mean, a function showing the bending moment distribution along the beam, the slope of that function is equal at each point, is equal to the value of the shear force in that location. I showed you if we have a function showing the distribution of the shear force along the beam, then the slope of that function at any point along the beam is equal to the intensity of the force applied in that location. And then by integrating these two equations, I showed you that the change in bending moments between two points along the beam is equal to the area under the curve showing the shear force distribution and also, by integrating this equation, I showed you that the change in shear force between two points is equal to the area under the curve showing the distributed load. So we already had these two equations. Now this sh diagram shows the, the, the exaggerated deformed geometry of the beam. At the <coughs> moment, this is located on the neutral plane, so it is a line which, has, which is subject to no stress and no strain. So Z is along the axis, and this is the Y coordinate, obviously. Now, if this is the deformed geometry of the beam, we are interested in an equation showing the deflection variation along the beam. So V is the deflection at each point, and V is a function of Z. You can see deflection varies along the beam. Here is the maximum for the supported beam and so on. So V, deflection distribution, is a function of Z. So based on what you already know, if I draw a line at any point along this deformed geometry, a function showing the deflection along the beam, this gives me the slope at each point. So this is the tangent at each point, and the angle this line makes, this tangent makes with the z-axis in the anticlockwise direction is the slope. So the slope at this point is a theta. If I draw a line, a tangent to this point, obviously it has a different slope. So say the slope at this point, the angle this line mix with the z-axis in the anticlockwise direction is theta plus d theta. So if I draw a line normal to this point and normal to this point, where they intersect is the center of the radius of the curvature. And the central angle is the difference between these two slopes. So if this is a theta and this is theta plus d theta, the angle these two make 
is this, the difference between these two slopes. And I showed you what R is, radius of the curvature. So Vz is the deflection distribution along the beam, and theta, a slope at any point, is the slope, theta z is the slope distribution along the beam. Now the next step is to find the relations between these two and the shear force, bending moment, or the distributed load. Now this is a slope at each point. What is the definition of a slope? If I've got a function such as V showing the deflection distribution, the slope at that position or the tangent of angle theta must be equal to the derivative of the function with respect to z. This is a definition is something you already know. The slope at any point of a function. Now, if I attach a linear coordinate system at this end, such as S, this, do you agree, this is equal to ds in this curvilinear coordinate system. So if this is ds, I can say ds equal to r times d theta. Where does this come from? From this small arc. So I can say 1 over radius of the curvature is d theta over ds. Now we are talking about a small deflection theory or a, a small curvature a very, very def a small deformation, like the beams at the moment which are holding us in position. If we don't see any deformation by naked eye, so this line at the moment is very, very close to the z-axis. So I can say approximately ds and dz are the same. So I can say 1 over r is equal to d theta over dz, approximately. Now if I substitute this equation, so I showed you that with theta equal to dv over z, therefore I can say 1 over r is equal to the second derivative of deflection with respect to z. Now this is common knowledge. In books they don't prove it for you, they just say curvature at each point of a beam subject to bending equals the second derivative of deflection with respect to z. In some books, they don't prove this for you, but this is just for your general information. It's not examinable, it's just for you to know where this is coming from. In majority of textbooks, they directly write it because this is common knowledge. So, curvature at each point of a beam subject to bending is equal to the second derivative of the deflection, any function showing the deflection distribution with respect to z. So this is one of our second derivative of deflection with respect to z. When I was explaining for you the um, normal stress on the section, I showed you that 1 over r is equal to m over ei. Now if I just get rid of r or eliminate r between these two equations, then I can say ei, second derivative of deflection with respect to z equal to mz, the bending moment. Just remember, please write down next to this, <coughs> sorry, m is a function of z. A common mistake among you, 20% of the students, they assume it's a constant value m. It's not a constant value, it's a function of z. So I've written it in bracket, z in front of it. Now, the product of E and I is called a bending stiffness. Do you remember, we had torsional stiffness, we had axial stiffness or axial rigidity. So, EI, the product of the Young's modulus and second moment of area is called bending stiffness or bending rigidity. The higher value of EI is, the lower value of the deflection is and vice versa. And you can see it has an element of the material property, an element of the geometry of the section. It, it works very similar to GJ when we had in torsion, in torsion section or similar to uh, EA when we were in axial loading section. Now, if I, at the moment, I have sine of m hidden in this function, so in some books they write minus m, minus mz, the, so in that case they assume the downward deflection is a negative, sorry, positive. So at the moment I have assumed the negative sign is hidden, so the downward deflection comes up to be negative and upward deflection 
comes up to be positive. So in some books, they put, for, they put a minus sign here, as I repeat, and they assume the downward deflection is uh, positive. You're an aerospace student, so you're doing a wing design, so therefore the deflection must be positive when it's going upward. So I would suggest to leave the negative sign hidden inside them. So the positive deflection will be upwards, then the negative deflection will be downwards. Now this equation for a symmetric bending, and if I just integrate it once, at the moment we've got second derivative of deflection with respect to z, we are after deflection. The first derivative gives us the slope at any point along the beam. Obviously when you integrate a finite function, then you need to add a constant value to the function. And the next derivative uh, integral gives us, sorry, not derivative, the next integral gives us uh, the deflection distribution. So we need a second constant value to be added. We can find those constant values using boundary conditions, end conditions of the, or support conditions of the beam. And you can also find a direct relation between uh, the shear force and deflection or combining the top equations or the distributed load and deflection. I do not recommend you to use these two equations because it, if you have shear forces applied, then the stiff functions will just disappear from the equation. But this is how to show it mathematically, a direct relation between the shear force and deflection and distributed deflection. But my advice is to use these two equations. So on the slide number 14, we find a direct relation between the bending moments applied to the beam and a deflection distribution along the beam. Any question regard to a slide 14? This is not new to you. Okay. So let's go back to a slide and um, the question number uh, one and the cantilever beam. In the first hour, I showed you how to find the normal stresses applied to the beam. Now the next stage of the problem is asking us to find the deflection distribution and also the maximum deflection of the beam. So this is what we had last week. The general equations for the distributed load, a shear force and bending moment. And that is the equation relating the bending moment and the deflection distribution. M is not constant. M is a function of Z, which is a linear function which is equal to FZ minus FL. So I'm going to substitute in the top equation. The first integration gives us the a slope distribution at any point along the beam. So EI dV over dZ or EI theta equal to, this is a linear function, becomes quadratic, its constant becomes linear, and then we need to add a constant value to the equation. The next integration gives us the deflection, so this becomes cubic, quadratic, linear, and then you need to add another constant value. So we know, find C1 and C2 using the boundary conditions or end conditions or support conditions of the beam. The deflection at the clamp support is zero. So at z equal to zero, the deflection is zero. So therefore, C2 must be equal to zero. At the clamp support, the slope is also zero. So if I draw it for you here, this is the deformed geometry. What was the definition of a slope? If I draw a tangent to it, So if I draw a tangent at this position, the angle it makes with the z-axis in the anticlockwise, that is the slope at this position. So at this position, the slope is equal to zero. So therefore, at the clamp support, the deflection is zero, the first constant value is zero, the second constant value is zero because the slope is zero as well. So if we substitute in the top equation, 
Then, C1 and C2 are zero. The problem is asking us to find the maximum deflection. Where is the position of the maximum deflection for a cantilever beam? Obviously, it's at the clamp support, at the free, set, free end, where Z is equal to L, just substitute it. So that is the Vmax. So it is a negative, so it is downward deflection. And at Z equal to zero, L, I can also find the slope, which is minus FL squared divided by 2EI. Any questions in relation to the solution for the second part of question one? So we had the bending moment distribution using the relation between the bending moment and deflection. We can easily find the deflection distribution along the beam. Right? Now, say we've got a beam. It's a subject to a lateral concentrated force or lateral shear force at distribution load. You can write the general equation for, obviously, equations for this beam, which is a bit more complicated in terms of loading. Or you can use the superposition rule. You can solve the problem when it's just subject to a lateral concentrated force and then find also solve the problem when it is just subject to the distributed load. Once you solve them, you just, for each case, find the deflection, find the stresses, and then add them up. Or use the design handbooks in future. Obviously, you, some of you forget these equations. If you have the design handbooks, all the answers for the deflections, the stresses, or you can find them in design handbooks. So for this problem, you just find, add up the solutions of this case to the other case. So if you're after the def maximum deflection of the first one, you find the deflection of this cantilever beam subject to a shear force. Deflection when it's subject to distribute a load, add them all, and the same as slopes. Now, we move on to slide 25 I showed you last week. If I've got a beam which is subject to a series of forces in the YZ plane and a series of forces in the XZ plane, again, we use a superposition rule. So the forces applied in the YZ plane apply bending moment about the X axis. And the forces applied in the XZ plane apply bending moment about Y axis. So I just first solve the problem when the forces are applied in the YZ plane, find the general equations for MX, and double integrate it to find the vertical deflection. And which Second moment of area I need for this case, I need Ix, because the bending moment is applied about the x-axis. So I have added this wording. You don't have it on the slide 25. I've added it. Now, we move on to the next plane, xz plane. The force is applied in the xz plane, so the moment is about the y-axis. I need a second moment of area about the y-axis, and then, if I double integrate the general equation for my, then I end up with the horizontal deflection. And that is what you're going to do to answer the last part of your assessment sheets, the question. So you have a series of loads applied in the XZ plane. If you double integrate the bending moment, it gives you horizontal deflection. And for the other one, it gives you vertical deflection. Any questions? Yes, please. Um, why is the horizontal deflection like a smooth curve or something? Oh, it's, this is just random. It's just, oh. yeah, you mean that this should be the same as that one? No, it's just right. 
Uh, do you mean that this should, this line here should be the same as this line? Sorry? It's okay. Okay. It's just random. It's just a random picture. It's an example. Any questions in regard to this slide? Okay. Now let's look at the slide number 26. So I've got a beam. It's subject to a bending moment about it on the x-axis, the bending moment about the y-axis. Now I'm after the normal stresses acting on the cross-section. So if I look at the mx, the bending moment, it produces uh, the normal stress in the z direction. And this is the profile of the stress distribution, normal stress, sigma, which is about the, in, in, in the z direction. Now look at the bending moment applied in the xz, the force step on the xz plane, and the bending moment about the y-axis. That also produces the normal stresses in the z direction, but look at the profile. So both of these two moments are applying normal stresses in the z direction. I know they are from in different, applied in different planes, but the outcome, the stresses applied from them, are in the z direction. So therefore, I am allowed to add them up. I am allowed to solve them separately, and the normal stresses can be added together. So it means, in the, from the first case, this is a normal stress coming from the MX, and the second moment of area IX. From the other one, I have MY X divided by IY, but because they are in the same, the, no, the stresses are in the same direction, then I'm allowed to add them up. So I repeat, the moments are in different planes, the forces are in different planes, but in terms of the normal stresses, they are applying to the cross-section, the, the stresses are in the same direction, the normal stress in the same direction, so we, can, we are allowed to add them up. Any question or questions if we got, if we got to this slide? So the next part, so I've done normal stresses acting on the cross-section, I've done deflections acting. The next stage is a shear stress, so flexural shearing stresses, which is a slightly harder. So this is the slide I showed you earlier. A beam which is subject to pure bending moment, lateral shear force in terms of the stresses, is subject to normal stresses on the cross-section, shear stresses on the cross-section, and in a longitudinal direction. Now say we are looking at an element with the length of dz of, from this beam. So we move on to a slide 13, please. So I skipped slide 13. I covered everything else. Now I'm going back to um, slide 13, and I'm going to explain how we can find the shear stresses acting in a beam. Slightly harder. So this is a beam. So this, you're looking at the element I showed you earlier with the length of dz from a beam which is subject to a lateral shear force. Say this is the shear force acting at this location. I'm interested to find the shear stresses acting on a plane, on this plane, and also on a plane, this plane here, with the width of dz and, sorry, the with the width of dz and length of dz, with the width of b and length of dz. So I'm interested to find the shear stress acting on this plane. So this is what I'm interested, to find the shear stress on this plane. Now I'm looking at this, the cross section from this angle. I've added this i for you. So if you look at it from that direction, this is what we see. So this is this rectangle which I've drawn it for you. This is a neutral axis. So this is the front view of this part. 
So if you're after the shear stress acting on this plane, which is normal, passing through this line, and normal to the plane of the slide. Based on what I showed you, the bending moment distribution is not constant. If we have a bending moment on this side of the element, which is M1, on the other side is either B or smaller. So we have M1 and M2 acting on these two sides. Based on the equation we have, sigma is equal to M y over I, I can say the stress acting, the stresses, normal stress is acting on this section is equal to M y over I, and on this section is equal to M2 of M2 y over I. So therefore the stresses, the normal stresses acting on the two sides of this element are not the same, they're different. The difference between these two makes this shear stress here. Let's say we are looking at an element on this area with the value of dA. So I'm looking at an element here which is equal to dA. This element is subject to a stress of a sigma multiplied by dA. So sigma 2 multiplied by dA gives me the force applied on this little element. A similar value we have it on the other side. Now if I integrate sigma 2a dA from the top layer, the free surface, to the layer I'm interested to find its shear stress. So it gives me a force. The force applied, the normal force applied on this section. Now on the left hand side, we have a bending moment of M1. The stress is sigma 1. If I just do the same job, I can find the force applied on the left-hand side of the element. Yes, please. Um, with what uh, reference point is the moment taken from? This is not a moment. No, but the M1 and M2. <clears throat> uh, okay. We've got a beam, say a simply supported beam, is subject to a force. No, can I finish? Can I finish first? Okay, we've got a beam, simply supported, say. It's got a force applied somewhere. So then you find the bending moment distribution based on that lesser shear force applied. So M is not a constant value of bending moment. It's changing along the length. So this is the whole, I've just, this is a beam. So if I have a variation of bending moment along the length, the bending moment at this section is M1, at this section is M2. Does it answer the question? Um, I, I it for a call. No, don't make, that's fine. So this is a beam. Say this is simply supported. And I am applying a shear force here somewhere. So based on the shear force I'm applying, I find the, bending moment, the shear force distribution along the beam, which I showed you how to do it, and I find the bending moment distribution along the beam. Now I'm looking at two points here. Say this is point one, and this is point two. Because Z is not the same in these two, we have different bending moments applied. So we have M1 and M2. Does it answer the question? Okay. So if I just go back. So we have different normal stresses acting at these two sections. Now we are after the shear stress acting on this plane. The plane which is passing through this line and is normal to the plane of the slide. Now the normal stress acting on this plane we can find it using this equation, but I am interested to find the force applied, the normal force applied to this gray area. In order to do that, I find, uh, to take an element, the stress on this element is equal to sigma 2 times dA. Now I integrate it from the, free from the top layer, the free surface, with the distance of y2 from the neutral axis to y 
h which is located in this plane which is located at the distance of h. So if I integrate this term from the top layer and the bottom layer, this layer, I find the force applied on this section. If I do the same on the left hand side, I can find the force applied on the left hand side of it. Now the difference between these two forces creates this shear force applied or shear stress applied. If there is no shear force, if we have got applying a pure bending moment, then the, the two are the same. There won't be any shear force applied. We have this because of this shear force applied and the variation of the bending moments applied here. Now I'm going to just equate it. So this is the shear stress applied. The area is equal to this width, which is B. The length, which is dz, so it gives me a shear force, which is equal to the difference between these two. Now I'm going to substitute these two terms in these two equations. And I'm going, so I'm just substituting these two, my, m1 y over i, m2 y over i. For a particular value of a shear force, m2 and m1 are constant. i is a constant value. They can be extracted from the integral. And I can divide both sides by b dz. So this is what I've done. I have extracted m2 over i, m1 over i from the integrals, because for a particular value of the shear force applied, they're constant values. And I divided both sides by b dz. So I'm going to write this as m2 minus m1 divided by i b dz. And this is the integral of y dz. Does anyone remember what was this called in chapter 3? <coughs> y squared dA was second moment of area. But what y dA was? Was y squared, yes please? Very good. First moment of area, absolutely correct. So this is first moment of area. But first moment of area of what? With respect to what? This is y2 to h. It means this is the first moment of area of the region enclosed between the top layer or free surface and the layer we are interested to find is shear stress with respect to the neutral axis. So I repeat, this is the first moment of area of this gray region. The region which is enclosed between the layer we are interested to find is shear stress and the top layer with respect to the neutral axis. And what was the definition of the first moment of area? We can show it as an integral or is equal to the area multiplied by centroid of this gray region with respect to the neutral axis, which is y bar times a prime. I showed it with a prime. I use a for the whole section. a prime is this gray region. So therefore, the shear stress acting in this section is equal to dm over dz, the derivative of the moment with respect to z, first moment of area of this region, divided by the second moment of area of the cross-section, multiplied by width. And dm over dz is equal to the shear force distribution, or shear force at each location. So the slope of the bending moment distribution is the slope. So therefore, the shear stress acting is equal to V times I over IB. So the shear force, if I'm after the shear force, the shear stress acting at any section, I need to have the shear force acting in that location, the second moment of area, the width of the section, and the first moment of area of the region trapped, enclosed between the layer I'm interested in and the top layer, the free surface. Now, can somebody tell me what is the value of, because as you can see, V is constant, I is constant, B is constant. So, shear stress can be defined by I. And I is equal to Y bar times A prime, which is this area. 
So if I just move this line gradually to the top, does the stress get smaller or bigger? So if I move this line to this line here, do you agree the area gets smaller? Does the shear stress get smaller as well? Very good. So if I just go, go up, 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 I reach the very top. What is the shear stress equal to at the top? Excellent, is equal to zero. So when I apply a shear force, the top and bottom layers are not in contact with any materials. The shear stresses in them is equal to zero. Now, if I move this layer lower, do you agree that the shear stress gets higher and higher? So where is the position of the maximum shear stress? Decentralized. Neutral axis, this is what you meant, neutral plane or neutral axis. Maximum shear stress is the neutral? Yes, on the neutral plane. So the maximum shear stress occurs when we have the maximum I value. Where do we have the maximum I value is on the neutral plane. You can see the area is full now. So if I move this violet line, I don't know which color you see, if I move it to the top or to the bottom, it gets changed, the value of I changes. On the top, it's zero. And on the neutral axis, we get the maximum values. Any questions on slide number 13? So this is the equation we usually use for solid sections or thick wall sections. For thin wall sections, I'm going to make some changes to this equation. Any question on this slide? I move on to the remaining part of question number one. So for question number one, we, what I just I remind you what we've done so far. We found normal stresses. We found the maximum deflection. Now, the next stage is to find the shear stresses or maximum shear stresses applied to the beam. So the problem is asking us to find the maximum shear stress and also the shear stress acting on a layer which is located at a distance of 30 millimeters from the neutral axis or neutral plane. So that's the equation for it. I is constant, the second moment of area is constant, capital I. B is constant, the width. What is B equal to? That's correct. The width is 60 millimeters. Second moment of area, I found it earlier, 1 over 12 bh cubed. The shear force is asking us the maximum shear stress. Now look at the shear force diagram. Can I say it's the same along the length? Does it make any difference where we are looking at in this case? So the shear force is the same. We've got F here, and it is the same along the length. It doesn't change. So V is the same. V is equal to F. Now look at the equation here. I have found it at 30 millimeters first. OK. So here we've got, first I found it at this layer. This is I, which is 8.64 times 10 to the power of 6. B is equal to 60 millimeters. The shear force is the same along the length. It doesn't matter which section we are looking at. F is the same, which is 10 kilonewtons, so 10 times 10 to the power of 3. Now, the only complexity is this bit. The first moment of area of this section, which is enclosed between this layer and the free surface. The area of this section is 30 multiplied by 60. And the, sec the centroid of this gray area is located at the distance of 45 millimeters from the neutral axis. This is a re rectangle. This is 15. And this is 30. So 30 plus 15 gives us 45. It gives us 1.56 megapascals. Let's do it for the for this section. So we've got force is the same. What shall I write here, please? Could you help me? What does it, does what goes inside the brackets?
What is the area of the gray region? 60 multiplied by 60, very good. And its centroid is located at the distance of 30 from the neutral axis. So we've got 60 by 60 by 30. So here, we've got the area of this gray region. We've got 60 by 30. And this is located at the distance of 45, the centroid of this gray region. Now we moved it to the neutral axis, so we've got the maximum shear stress acting is 2.08 megapascals. <coughs> but what do we get out of this? This is what we did earlier. We found the normal stress acting, maximum normal stress, which is 138.88 megapascals. I would like you to compare the maximum normal stress and maximum shear stress. Do you agree that, <coughs> my apology, if you're designing this beam, if it is a solid section, in comparison with the 138, this is negligible. It's a small. So, so when you're designing a solid section or a thick wall section, the value of the flexural shear stress is negligible, so you can ignore it in your design. But uh, any question? No. So, but when the section becomes very thin, this becomes huge, and that's the main factor for designing thin wall sections. So, I repeat: when we, are, we can see, I've shown you on this in this example, for design of a thick thick wall section, solid sections. The shear stresses, flexural shear stresses, in comparison with normal stresses, are very, very small. They can be neglected. For thin sections, they become quite large, become very big. So then that's the main factor when you're designing a thin wall sections, a thin wall section which is subject to lateral shear force. The flexural shearing is quite high. Any question in relation to this slide? So as I said, I solved all part of question 1D for you. The other ones are all available online. If, please go, go through them. If you have any questions, you can ask during the problem solving session on Friday. So let's make a summary of what we've covered so far. If you've got a beam which is subject to pure bending moment, the cross-section is subject to normal stresses. And I showed you, it has a linear variation. We have zero stress on the neutral axis, on neutral plane. We have maximum stresses at top and bottom layers, which are located at the highest distances from the neutral plane. We have the, because it depends on y. This is the equation. It's a linear function in terms of y. This is zero, and we've got the maximum difference Distance is on the neutral axis, so we have maximum stresses at the top and bottom layers. Now, if a beam is subject to a lateral shear force or lateral distributed load, not only the beam is subject to normal stresses on the cross section, also is subject to shear stresses, not only on the cross section, also in the longitudinal direction of the beam. And the reason is that shear stress is always complementary. If you've got one shear stress acting on a plane, you've got it on a plane normal to the first one. And I'll show you how to find the shear stress or flexural shear stress applied to a beam subject to lateral shear force. So this is what I said earlier. Shear stresses in beams subject to lateral shear forces are called flexural shear stresses. Now, based on this equation, we have maximum stresses acting on the top and bottom layers. And we've got maximum shear stresses acting on the neutral plane. So in order to optimize the weight of this section, you need to remove materials from where they're not doing much. 
So in that case, instead of having a rectangular <coughs> section, we end up with an eye section. And these are the eye sections used in constructions of buildings, the ones at the moment holding us in position. But we make it a slightly taller as well to have increased eye value. So I have, <coughs> we have maximum normal stresses on the top and bottom layers, and we have shear stresses, maximum shear stresses on the neutral plane. So I've removed the materials from where they're not doing much. But at the same time, you need to make it taller as well. <coughs> are, you, are you okay? Yeah. Okay, just, you have water. That's fine. I did what well, happened to me as well. <laughs> All right, okay. So, so, as I said, for thick sections, solid sections, flexure shearing is, not, is uh, not an important factor, but when a structure is thin, that's the main factor for its design. Any questions on the slide 16? Okay, so the remaining slides are slightly harder, so I'm going to just go through slide 17, and the remaining ones will be done next week. So we're going to, as I said last week, if I've got a beam, it's a solid, thick walled or thin walled. Would you like me to finish it now? You've got seven minutes left. So. Okay, thank you. So, if you've got a beam, it doesn't matter it's solid or it's thin walled or thick walled. Normal stress values can be obtained using the same equations, and deflection distributions can be obtained using the same equations. The only difference between them is a flexure shearing. For solid sections, like mechanical engineers, they ignore flexure shearing because usually they deal with solid and thick wall sections. For aerospace students, so flexure shearing becomes the main factor for designing thin sections. Similar to what we did in previous chapters, instead of, a flex, instead of shear stress, we can use shear flow when the section is a thin. And what was the definition of the shear flow? That is the product of the thickness and the shear stress. <coughs> it was contagious. Okay, that was the product of the shear stress and the thickness. And that is the force applied per unit a length of the section. Say we've got this cantilever beam. So this is a very, very simple example. So what we do next week are slightly harder. So this is a cantilever beam. Say the cross-section is a thin panel, which is subject to a lateral shear force, and the shear force is constant along the length. It's a cantilever beam subject to just lateral shear force. So the thickness is T, and the height, say, is equal to 2H. So this is the force applied. The equation still is valid. If the section has one axis of symmetry, we can still use this equation. Now, what is the value of B equal to in this equation? What is the width of this uh, panel? T, well done. So, B is equal to T. And what is the product of tau and T called? It's called shear flow. So, therefore, I can say the shear flow for this beam is equal to VI over capital I. I is the second moment of area of the cross-section, and I, little i, depends on which point we are looking at. Say I'm looking at this section of this beam, of this panel, which is located at the distance of y from the x-axis. Similar to what we did with the rectangular section, I'm looking at this section of the cross-section. <coughs> So in order to use this equation, I need to find the first moment of area of this region with respect to the x-axis. V is equal to F. 
What is I equal to? I is equal to Y bar over A prime, multiplied by A prime. What is A prime equal to is equal to T multiplied by this distance, which is T times H minus Y. If this is Y, if this is distance is Y, therefore the height of this little area is H minus Y, the thickness is T, so the area I, A prime is T times H minus Y. And what is y bar equal to? If this is y and this is h, y bar is equal to h plus y divided by 2. So f of i, h plus y over 2 is this point because this is equal to h, this is equal to y, therefore this point, the distance of this point from here is h plus y over 2. What is this area equal to is t times h minus y, therefore is equal to ft divided by 2i multiplied by h squared minus y squared. What is capital I is equal to? The second moment of area is 1 over 12 bh cubed. b is t, h cubed is 2h cubed. If I substitute this equation, I end up with this relation here. But what does this tell us? It tells us that the shear flow distribution on the cross section is quadratic in terms of y. Now, say I use a curvilinear coordinate system, which we are going to do it just for this slide. I use Cartesian. For the remaining ones, I only use curvilinear one. I just want to show you the difference, then we can easily move on to the next part. Let's, let's be repeated using curvilinear coordinate system. Equation is the same. Now, in the curvilinear coordinate system, if this is the origin, the coordinate of this point is S. Therefore, A prime is equal to S multiplied by T. What is y bar equal to in the curvilinear coordinate system? Y bar is equal to, if this is S, so this is, so this is S, T S is A prime, Y bar is, this is S, this is H, so this is H minus S over 2, this is S over 2, this is H, so therefore it's H minus S over 2, so it becomes H S minus S squared over 2. So you can see both of them is obviously quadratic. So this is the shear flow distribution of this panel, which I've done it on the side. So the, at top layer, S0, so we have zero shear flows because these are not in contact with any material. So you can see little i changes gradually increases, and we've got maximum a shear flow on the cross section. So look at these arrows, please. We have a smaller ones and gradually they become bigger. The biggest one is here and then become a smaller. And this is the position of the maximum shear flow. Now if someone asks me after drawing the shear force diagram to find the maximum shear stress, I just need to divide the value of the shear flow in that location by its thickness. So if was, I was asked to find the shear stress in that location, I just divide the shear flow by, so at this location, S equal to, say, Y is zero. You can have 3F over 4H or 3F over 2H if this is, the whole thing is 2H. And if we were asked to find the shear stress in that location, I divide it by the thickness. And, okay, this is a very important point, actually, here. Now, what is F divided by H times T? H times T, you agree this is called cross-sectional area. If H to 2 HT is the, this black area, which is the cross-sectional area of the beam. So therefore, the maximum shear stress acting in that section is one and a half times F over A. But what does this tell us? When we were in chapter one, 
and a component was subject to simple shear, if the area was A, the force was F, F divided by A gave us the shear stress applied to the section. But look at this, we cannot use it, that, so cannot use that equation anymore. It's not called simple shear, you can see it is one and a half times F of A. So if I've been given, a few students make this mistake in exam, if I have got a lateral shear force, if I divide F by A, it's not accurate. You can see the shear flow distribution is not constant. And you can see the shear stress is one and a half times F over A. It's not F over A anymore. So this is just only case that I use a both coordinate system, Cartesian and Kevin-linear one. For the remaining one, it's much, much easier for us to just use Kevin-linear coordinate system. So any questions? No? Thank you very much, and see you on Friday. Thank okay. you.